Today we're going to show you three different quick and easy plant-based recipes. But before we get started cooking, I want to talk a little bit about the, our approach to plant-based cooking and how we got here. Yeah, uh, about three and a half, four years ago at the time of this filming, uh, I had a heart attack and I needed to change a lot of things. And so I had a friend that suggested whole food, plant-based, no oil cooking. And I converted a bunch of my cooking styles to that. And I've had some great success on it. And my doctors are very pleased with it. So I've adopted this style and I want to now share this with other people. So we have these videos. So as Brian said, our approach is whole food, plant-based, and no oil. And really all of the description is right there in the title. Every time you substitute a whole food for a plant-based or for a processed food or a plant-based food for an animal food, you're going to improve your health. And the evidence seems to point to the fact that removing processed oil from your diet, any oil, is really a positive step. But this isn't a medical video. So if you're going to make any significant changes to your diet, we recommend that you do that in cooperation with your healthcare professional. Our experience has been eating like this can have a profound impact on your overall health. But again, consult your doctor or healthcare professional before you make any significant changes. But now let's get cooking. Today we're gonna to make three different dishes. Uh, I am going to start off with a Southwest scramble, uh, sort of my egg substitute for that. Uh, I will follow it up with a Mongolian barbecue pasta dish, and then we will have... Yeah, I'll finish up by making a pound cake or quick bread, and uh, with all of the recipes that we're going to show you, we'll show you the baseline recipe, and then we're going to show you some variations so that you can make this your own. If you're looking for more resources, whether it's about whole food plant-based oil for eating or for recipes, this video is being sponsored by the Indianapolis Public Library. And I know they have a great resource list. Whether you're watching this through the IPL or through your own library, or you just found us on YouTube, to work with your librarian. They are great resources for being able to do your own research and make better decisions. Let's get into our first recipe. Let's get started. My Southwest Scramble. The dish starts with uh, diced onion, diced bell pepper, sliced mushrooms, and I'm going to include uh, sprouted tofu. Now this is a non-silken tofu. Uh, we only need about half this package, so I will come back with that. Uh, those places where I want some body, some uh, some filler, stuff like that, just uh, such as a egg substitute, I'll use a non-silken tofu. So as you see on the video here, I've sliced into wedges, or actually into slabs, and I'm placing in the paper towel and we'll squeeze off some of the extra water and let it sit for a little while while I do the rest of the dish. I start with a medium to medium high heat and I'm using a dry saucepan on this. Uh, you can saute onions and vegetables without oil. Uh, it takes a little bit more effort and you have to stay with it. 
Uh, usually you start off more at a lower temperature and you have to pay attention and keep an eye on it so it doesn't get away with you or away from you. if your vegetables start to stick is use just a little bit of water. Uh, I get a little cup like this to have on hand. A splash in the pan will uh, help steam off any of the stuff that has uh, cooked on the pan. It also helps lower the pan's temperature for a little bit. Once the vegetables have cooked down, you see I'm sort of working off the bottom and I'm just using the moisture that was in the vegetables here. So I haven't had to add any extra water. But these are about ready. With the tofu, since I want it to simulate eggs, I want to crumble this up about the size of broken egg whites. And so I'm using little bite-sized pieces. You can do this as big or as fine as you'd like. Uh, it will break down a little bit more as you are cooking, so don't be worried if it's too big. Okay, I'm going to finish off the last of this tofu. And I, what I'm trying to do also on this is dry out, draw a lot of the moisture out of this. Uh, at this point, I will also be adding the spices. Now the spices I'm using for this is going to be garlic, cumin, black salt, salt, chili powder, and turmeric. The turmeric is more for the color. It'll help give you a nice yellow richness to it. And the black salt adds a little bit of sulfur to it. So you get that eggy smell and taste. I try to put it mostly on the, just the tofu and then work that in. If it gets mixed in with the other vegetables, it's not a problem. you think it's thoroughly mixed into the tofu, just mix everything together. Now at this point I like to put in some power greens. Power greens are spinach, kale, and Swiss chard. You can add just plain spinach if you like. You can add some other greens. I like to chop these up into eh, probably about one inch square pieces. And we'll put those on top and let those wilt down. So don't think that you have too much if you fill the pan, which you'll see here in a I like to use some salsa. Now this is a red pepper salsa. You could use uh, a green chili sauce, salsa, uh, any of your favorite. I would try to stay away from some of the flavored ones like the uh, 
rum or the pineapple or the pumpkin, um, I found that they don't always seem to mix well with the other flavors. And you can put on as, as much or as little as you'd like. At this point, I want to steam the vegetables. So I will use a little bit of my water, put it in a couple of spots, and then I'll put the lid on and let this cook for a while. About three or four minutes should do. Once they're wilted down, just mix them all in. Uh, at this point, I also use the leftover water in the bottom to scrape off the bottom of the pan. Again, remember, I have not used any oil in this pan. Now I like to add sort of a cheese flavor. Now this could be added with either straight nutritional yeast, or in this case, uh, this is a uh, cauliflower queso cheese mix that we found. Uh, it's all plant-based. There's no oil in it. Uh, it's very good. It's got some nice flavoring to it. Uh, although before I add it, I want to kind of burn off uh, some of the extra moisture that's in the bottom of this pan. Start off a little light on the cheese until you see how it mixes in. You can always add more. It's taking it away that's the problem. Uh, I'm going to use the whole wheat pitas that I have here. Uh, as you can see, I got them from Trader Joe's. One of the things that I found with the pitas is there tends to be a direction that the dough is made in. And so I look for cracks or lines, and then I cut along those lines or in those same directions. It helps keep the pita from splitting on me. As you can see, I've got the pita here. This is what it would look like if I used it in just the bowl. So now that we've gotten through the recipe, let's talk about a few variations, okay? Uh, right at the beginning, mm -hmm. right, you started with, um, what was it, peppers, onions, and- Mushrooms. Mushrooms. But you can really use any you any can, vegetables you like. You could you could use a frozen stir fry vegetables. You can use broccoli. You could use. Uh, I also go in later on and I did the, the power greens. Mm -hmm. um, 
and again, you can use spinach with that. You can use just straight kale, whichever combination you'd like. Right. Uh, this just adds some more vitamins and minerals mm -hmm. and some iron and stuff like that to the dish. Right. But well, well, you did jump to the end there. So if we talk about the greens, yeah, you could use frozen greens mm -hmm. if, if oh, yeah. that's what you have, especially since uh, you know, when frozen greens thaw, they give up a lot of water, but you've got the heat in there. And I saw throughout the recipe, you're driving water off with the heat. Yeah, except while I am cooking the greens and I need that water for steam. Right. So, uh, so yeah, if you're using the frozen, go ahead and put those in. You may not need to add the water mm -hmm. uh, oh. because they will give you the, the water as they thaw mm -hmm. and they'll steam themselves. Great. So let's talk a little bit about tofu. Okay. Okay. In the recipe, you are using the refrigerated uh, cottony tofu that comes in the plastic tubs that you find in the refrigerator. Yeah. Uh, right. The refrigerated section. Right. Yeah. Now, what other people may, or one of the other things that people may see is is this stuff, right? This shelf stable. You don't find it in the refrigerated section. Tofu, and I don't know if you can see it on camera here, but it says silken. Silken. Right. right. So, what's the difference? Well, the silken uh, is made in a different process, and it has a smoother, creamier mouthfeel to it. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm doing something that I'm going to do for a sauce, uh, oh. if I'm doing like homemade mayonnaise, if I'm doing uh, a cheese sauce, uh, even doing a mousse, mm -hmm. if I want that nice, creamy, smooth mouse mouth feel to that, uh, use the silken. Mm -hmm. The non-silken, the cottony versions, if I want some body to it, if I want oh. it to have some bite, some chew, uh, uh, some texture mm -hmm. to the dish, then I will use it. I'll use the cottony uh, tofu. Right. Now, uh, the cottony does tend to need to be dried and drained uh, and sometimes squeezed out. And you can do that between some paper towels. Right, you show that in the recipe. Yeah. And, uh, or you can use other towels or whatever. But I like to do the paper towels because there's less chance of fibers getting caught into that. Sure. Um, but yeah, uh, and there have been times where I have actually used both times in the same dish. Right. Because I wanted a cream sauce, but I wanted the body as well. Mm -hmm. So so that's the difference. So for this particular recipe, not this tofu, not but the, the stuff tofu. in the plastic tubs in the refrigerator. The, the cottony, the cottony body-based uh, tofu, yes. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that in the refrigerated section. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about plate up. You showed two different plate ups in your recipe. Mm -hmm. You did it in the pita and you did it in the bowl. I know that you've uh, taken that, put it in a ramp, and then stuck it in the air oven for a little while yeah. or a toaster oven yeah. and crisped up the wrap a little bit. We talked about uh, air frying some cubes of potato and doing it over that. Yeah. yeah. Other ideas? Uh, I did it one night, uh, I had some leftover. And I actually had some rice, and it was just cleaned out the refrigerator. I put the, the rice down, and I put this on top of it. And I thought it was very good. Mm -hmm. um, well, and th this gets into the vers versatility of these recipes. If you did it over rice, and you wanted to use a different sauce instead of the salsa, if you wanted to use a teriyaki sauce or a barbecue sauce, you could do that. I, I can't see anything that would go wrong with that. All right. So I think what we're really trying to encourage people to do is to use these as you like to call them base recipes, yes. but then experiment as much, as much as you like. If you've got a favorite ingredient, add it uh, in the spice mix. If you like spicy, add some hot peppers. Mm -hmm. If you like Indian spices, add some curry kinds of spices. Right. If you like Mediterranean, add some herbies. You, you could, yeah, you could take this in any cuisine direction you'd like just by changing your spice mix. Uh, as I've always said, I play with my food mm -hmm. and I, I'm not afraid to experiment. All right. So we're going to encourage people to experiment and we'll get on to the next dish. Mm -hmm. My Mongolian barbecue pasta dish. So I'm finishing up mushrooms again. Uh, in this next dish, I'm using frozen stir fry vegetables and sliced mushrooms. I wanted some extra mushrooms in it. This is a really simple dish. This is really quick.
Okay, again, I'm using a dry pan here. Uh, no oil. Uh, I'll have to get my water here in a second. Uh, but I wanted to get a start. There we go. Got my water. Uh, I wanted to get the uh, mushrooms started first because I wanted to wilt those down a little bit, get some of the uh, water off of them. Uh, once those are ready, I will add my uh, frozen stir-fry vegetables. This is about a pound of frozen vegetables. Oh, and it was about five ounces of mushrooms, I believe I added to this one. Just add a little extra water, and then I'm going to steam these. When I'm doing frozen vegetables, I like to make sure that they're thawed and they're cooked through. Uh, I usually try for an internal temperature of somewhere between 165 and 185. Um, I don't want them to actually melt down, uh, so I try to keep them more on the cool side so I have a little bite crunch to my dish. But if you don't have a thermometer, you can just pick out a piece of yeah. vegetable and taste it. Yeah. Does it feel, is it, is it thawed? Does it feel cooked? Do you like the flavor? And if you like your veggies a little softer, just cook them a little more. Yep. Okay, I finished off the vegetables here and I am only using the one burner. Like I said, this dish will go a lot faster with two burners. So uh, I'm going to now do my pasta. The pasta I'm using for this dish is a brown rice ramen noodle. And okay. this calls for about four minutes in boiling water. One of the things you want to do, especially if you're using uh, these noodle bricks like I've got here, uh, is you want to make sure that they break up and so that all the noodles will cook evenly. Uh, if you leave them in the brick form, the centers can still, they can take longer to cook. Okay, we've had four minutes. Yeah. Got it. Now I just need to drain this off and get my pasta. I'll bring my vegetables back on and start reheating those a little bit.
So there you just added the pasta. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of the water is being drained off of them and, and being burnt or dried <laughs> a little bit there. And now it's just working the vegetables into the noodles. Uh, that's pretty much the hardest part of this dish is trying to get the noodles to wrap around the vegetables. Now I know in the description I called this a Mongolian barbecue, uh, but I'm actually using a Korean barbecue sauce here. And uh, I'll let you see the title. I'm starting off with probably about three quarters of Is a cup. Um, but you can play with that. So there's the title. And then again, just work it into the dish and the noodles and bring everything up to temperature. Here, I'm adding some slivered almonds for taste and crunch. Okay. I think I'm going to leave this off the counter okay. and then serve up. I also like to top these off with some sliced green onion. And there we go. Quick, fast, easy vegetable and pasta dish. One of the things that I really like about this dish is it is a jumping point, jumping off point for almost anything that you want to do. So when you start, you can use whatever combination of fresh and frozen vegetables you like. Yep. Got a bunch of vegetables either out of the garden or because you it's the summer and you've been out shopping yep. and stuff's starting to get a little, you know, towards the end of its life in the refrigerator. Yep. Great way to use that up. Clean, clean out the refrigerator, do whatever, half an onion if you've got it, uh, some bell pepper, whatever you have available and on hand and you want to use up. Mm -hmm. and, and more in the cooler months, if you've got like some winter squash, some butternut mm -hmm. or something like that, is now that you're going to want to pre-cook because yep. it's not going to cook in the pan. Right. It, it, it takes longer to cook that. So, yeah, if you roast that in the oven, something like that, get it down to uh, 
it still has some body, sort mm -hmm. of al dente style, if you want to even use a pasta mm -hmm. uh, term. Um, yeah, you do that and then put that in uh, maybe even near the end mm -hmm. um, along with the pasta because well, you just want to heat that through then. Yeah. And one of the great things about the way you're cooking this is that because you've got the heat there, if you're using what are vegetables, like if you were using some tomatoes or something mm -hmm. like that, you can drive off more of that moisture yep. with the heat and just get it to a consistency that you like. Mm -hmm. And then the sauce is really anything you like. You use the, the Korean barbecue yes. sauce, but again, you could you could make your own sauce it, if there's it, a sauce that you like. You could do teriyaki, you could do... You could do a marinara and, and take it Italian, which again, you can also change the pasta around. Right. Well, this would be a great way to use up some leftover pasta or rice or potatoes or anything like that that you have yeah. in the fridge. Yeah, again, this is one of those, here's the base, what direction do you want to go in? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can you can add whatever sauce you want. Uh, as far as the nuts, uh, I added those to give a little bit of crunch and a little extra flavor. If you don't like nuts, if you don't want to use those, that's fine. If you have uh, sensitivities, pull them out, use something else. You could use uh, air fried tofu in there if mm -hmm. you wanted to. Um, just take some of the uh, uh, cottony tofu, dice it up, put it maybe in an air oven or even in your regular oven and just bake it till it's a little bit crisp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can garnish it with really anything you like. Mm -hmm. Again, if you like spicy food, a little crushed red chilies on there mm -hmm. would be really nice. Yeah, uh, if you wanted to take it into uh, sort of an Indian style, you could use the Kashmiri chili. Oh, uh, yes. So. Mm -hmm. so, again, lots of variations. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe it's time for dessert. Yeah, uh, at this point, we're going to dessert and snacks. So. Okay, so now we're going to make a banana walnut chocolate chip pound cake. And after we do that, I'll show you how you can use this technique to basically make any pound cake that you like. This really consists of two parts, a wet part and a dry part. And here you can see me putting together the wet part. I'm going to start with some mashed bananas. Now these bananas, even though they look really ripe, are still a little bit firm. So what I'm going to do is take them and put them in a measuring cup and then stick them in the microwave. I'm going to start with about a minute, a minute and a half, and then test them to see if they're soft enough. If they're nice and soft and liquidy, I'll go on. If they're not, and you can see in this case they weren't, I'll just do them for another half a minute and just keep microwaving them until they're thin and liquidy. My hand was in the way there, but as I was putting them back in the microwave, you can see they're still really holding on to their shape. So now I'm going to add some applesauce and what we really want is about a cup and a half to two cups of fruit pulp. If you're a little more or you're a little less, don't worry about it too much. We can make adjustments as we go along. So I'll ask you a question now. Okay. Why are you using the apple uh, applesauce cups, not a big jar? Ah, yeah, we use the applesauce cups because we found when we were buying applesauce, we don't make this often enough to go through a, a jar of applesauce before it uh, gets some mold on top. So the applesauce cups, although they do have the extra plastic with them, we're not throwing out applesauce anymore and we can have the cups around the house ready to go whenever we want. Uh, 
In fact, I think I use the applesauce cups for my little cups of water. Well, that's true. <laughs> they are handy little cups. So you'll note I do everything by weight. Uh, we will give you the weight and the volumetric equivalents for all of that. Now, we're going to add some sugar here. I'm using a sugar substitute, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we do uh, variations. But sugar is part of the wet ingredients. In baking, sugar is considered a wet ingredient because when it gets heated, it melts. Now for the dry. The biggest part of the dry ingredients is going to be the flour. We're going to use two cups of flour and in this case I'm going to use a mixture of whole wheat and all-purpose flour. You can really use any flour that you like. I found that if you go much more than about 25 percent or half a cup of whole wheat flour, it starts getting a little dry and tough. So. Do what you like, but um, I haven't had much success with going much over about a half a cup of whole wheat flour. And you could certainly do all 100% all purpose if you want. And then the dry mix gets rounded out with baking powder baking soda, and salt. And it's really tiny amounts of each, but they are really important. The big trick with this recipe is to keep the wet ingredients and the dry ingredients separate until you're ready to put the cake in the oven. Because it's the interaction between the wet and the baking powder and baking soda it's going to lift the cake and make it light. If you mix the two and let them sit around for a while before they go into the oven, a lot of that leavening or lifting uh, property is going to go away and your cake will be heavy. At this point, we're also going to add some flavoring, and in this case, I'm using about a teaspoon of cinnamon. And then I'm going to use a whisk, or you could use a fork, to mix the dry ingredients together really well. And you really want to do this for two reasons. One, it'll help break up any lumps in the dry ingredients so that when you add the, the wet ingredients, they'll all mix really evenly. And the other is it will distribute all the dry ingredients very well. I didn't do this once, and there was just a pocket of salt in one corner of the, of the pound cake and it wasn't very good. So now we're just going to mix the two parts together. So just put the wet ingredients on top of the dry and then start folding them together. What we want to do is take the dry ingredients and fold them over the top as you rotate the bowl. And just do this as gently as you can and mix as little as is necessary. You just want to bring the wet and dry together. If you overmix the batter, you're going to wind up with a tough, 
dry cake. What I see all the time is people will get out their big stand electric mixer, turn it up to 11, and beat it until everything is smooth and it looks beautiful, but you've really created a really tough dough that you're just not going to enjoy. I think some people have described the final product as a brick. Yes. So now we're going to add our mix-ins. And in this case, we're going to add some dark chocolate chips, dark vegan chocolate chips. And notice, not over mixing. And then some walnuts that we toasted a little bit in the oven. That just tends to bring better flavor. Yeah, it makes them a little crunchier and it brings out the flavor. Again, avoid the temptation to overmix. We're putting this in a silicone baking mold or, or loaf pan. We really like the silicone for a few reasons. One is it tends not to stick. So we don't have to use any oil or line it with parchment paper. And the other is when we take it out of the oven, we can flex the walls away that makes it easier to get out again without having to use a bunch of pan release or cooking spray or anything like that. Now, remember I said you could make adjustments along the way. If your dough is too stiff, you can add a little more fruit spread, you could add a little water, or you could add some plant-based beverage, plant-based milk, to thin it out a little bit. But as you can see, you can really work with a pretty stiff batter. So this is going to go into the oven at 350 degrees on the center rack. Usually start checking at about 40 minutes. And you're either looking for that classic when a skewer comes out clean, or if you have an instant read thermometer, we like to cook until the center reaches between 195 and 200 degrees. I kind of like the temperature thing a lot better because especially if you're using chocolate chip, that skewer is probably not going to come out clean uh, if it hits one of those chips. Exactly. If, if you have an instant read uh, or if you've been considering getting an instant read, it's really a great tool to have in the kitchen. And as you can see, after about 40 minutes, it needed to go back in for a little while. So another trip back to the oven, this time did about 15 or 20 minutes. Now, one of the things you'll notice is there's some aluminum foil on top. What we noticed was the top was starting to get a little brown. So we just loosely put some aluminum foil over the top to keep it from burning or getting too dark. We hit our temperature. And I'm just going to let it cool. I think we let it cool for about a half hour at least. Right. When it's cool, when and you can see I felt the bottom when it's you know, it doesn't have to be room temperature, but you know, not too cold, not too hot anymore. I'm using a plastic spreader here to help me separate the cake a little bit. Yeah, I found in my cooking uh, or baking that if you let it wait too long, it does get more difficult to get out of the pan. Mm -hmm. So you don't want it room temperature, but you want it just 
slightly warm. And here's what I was talking about, where that flexible mold, as you can see, I'm kind of peeling it off. And with a little practice, it comes out nice and clean. And then just let it cool completely before you slice it, because it will be much more stable once it's cool. You do that with your baked bread as well. That gets the, let it, the structure set. And there you have it. Chocolate chip walnut banana bread. Now, once you have this basic mix, you can really go in any direction that you want. The dry mix is pretty much going to stay the same. So the two cups of flour and the, the baking powder, baking soda, and salt. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you can add whatever spices you like. So if you like cinnamon, add cinnamon, nutmeg, um, cloves. If you're going to use cloves, go really light because a little bit of cloves goes a long way. And then change stuff up with the fruit. Right. So well, you've done a pumpkin. Right. So instead of bananas, I've used a can of pumpkin puree. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can also use other vegetables. You could use zucchini, shred up some zucchini. We've shredded up carrots and made a carrot cake like this. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to the pumpkin there, when you did your spices, then you did a pumpkin spice. Exactly. I used uh, the, the pumpkin spice mix that mm -hmm. you get, you know, in the stores around the holiday time. So, um, yeah, get creative with the fruit that you use. I've used pineapple puree. If you've got old fruit that's, you know, not rotten fruit, but fruit that's starting to get a little soft and you've got a blender, blend it up and use it as part of that, that, uh, that, that fruit mix, that wet mix, right? As long as you've got about a cup and a half to two cups of fruit pulp, and you've got something that's going to bind a little bit. So that's where either the bananas or the pumpkin or uh, the zucchini to some degree will help with that. And something that's going to be moist, like the applesauce. So that's the reason that we did the combination of bananas and applesauce. Right? The bananas gives us that binding quality, holds the cake together. And the applesauce is a substitute for having to put oil or butter into the cake. It keeps it moist. Right. And then the mix-ins, again whatever you like, between a half a cup and a cup of one to two mix-ins. Yeah. What I usually like to do is something that's either um, crunchy, you know, like nuts, mm -hmm. or I guess nuts, <laughs> uh, and then... Or chewy. Right, so you can do raisins, right. you can do any kind of dried fruit, actually. Well, you've done the dried fruit, dried cherries, and mm -hmm. reconstituted them. Right, so that's important to recognize. Uh, raisins are already pretty moist, mm -hmm. but if you do something like dried cherries or dried apricots, something that's really dry and chewy, what you might want to do is soak them in some warm or hot water for eh, maybe about a half an hour, and then drain them. You don't want that extra liquid in there before you add them in. So again, you can do any combination of add-ins that you like. I wouldn't do more than two add-ins. Uh, we've done coconut flakes. Mm -hmm. Just get creative, yeah. which brings us to the end of the series and our request to you. If you make these dishes and they work out or they don't work out, leave some comments below so that we know how to make them better. And if you've come up with some variations that you think are really good, Leave some comments below because we'll probably want to make them too. So I guess all that's left is to say thanks for watching yeah. and thanks to the Indiana Public Library for making this possible. And go out and play with your food and eat healthy. Yes. Take care. Be safe and healthy. Bye.